Welcome. My name is Jill Clyburn, and I am the lead person on the Solar Plus for Electric Co-ops program. I'm working here today with Simon Sandler and Christian Casillas to demonstrate the early decision model for utility solar plus storage systems. Uh, Simon Sandler is a project engineer from the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center, which is a partner on the SPECS project. And Christian Casillas has been the technical analyst for Clyburn and Associates on this project. Our aim with this project is to increase the pace and impact of solar plus storage procurements for rural electric co-ops and inclusively for all local distribution utilities. With co-funding from the NREL Solar Energy Innovation Network, we've developed a range of tools to support this goal. The early stage decision model became a core tool because as we like to say, you can't get what you want unless you know what to ask for. And this model helps to answer co-op questions about solar plus storage value streams and economics early in the project design and procurement process. Be sure as you go through this that you reference the user's guide for this tool. It's also posted on our website. Next slide. Let's just go to the next one, Simon. All right, great. Okay. So let's talk about the early stage decision model. So really the model is meant to be used in four steps, right? The first is like Jill said, you have to know what you want a little bit. And so the first thing is to define a scenario. Uh, the second thing is to collect the data you need. Then you take, take that data, you put it into that early stage decision model, and then you're gonna look at the results and compare it. Um, and this can be an iterative process. So you can take that last step and go back to the beginning to update your, your definition of what you want from the scenario and, and, and try and make a, make an open-ended loop of this to try and better understand what you're looking for. Um, that scenario definition uses uh, you know, some basic information about what you're looking for and how you as a utility and a distributed uh, distribution utility operate and what kind of size system you want to install. Then that data collection, you're going to collect the data from past years from your utility uh, operations, as well as some pricing and some case studies maybe, or, or that you want to test out, as well as running, uh, we run this model in complement and in tangent with SAM to help us uh, make a better informed model ourselves. And so you'll collect some data from SAM that Christian will walk you through in, in just a moment here. Put all that data we just collected into the model, and then we look at the results in the comparison using the models, some, some great graphics, as well as a sensitivity analysis and a gap analysis. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'll kind of walk you through those steps on what that looks like. So the model is a prescriptive model, meaning that it's not an optimization model like a lot of uh, industry models out there. And the, it, that's intentionally done so that it's, it's less complex and it takes a lot of the uh, the optimization out of it and it allows some assumptions to be made so that you all can get quick answers um, that are realistic answers though at the same time. Um, and so what this means is the model follows a logic wherein it, it determines in each step what is the best thing to do, um, or sorry, it determines in each step what is the value from each uh, value stream based upon what you've selected. So you're gonna collect, like we mentioned, and enter all that data, SAM data, economic and financial costs, and then the relevant use case. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna look at, and you're gonna select one of the value stacks preloaded into the model. And that value stack has uh, at up to three value streams, right? There's a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary value stream. And so the way the model works is it looks at the primary value stream you've selected in your value stack, and it tries to get the most value out of the battery and the solar doing the primary value stream. And then it moves to the tertiary, or sorry, the secondary value stream. And whatever is left over after being operated for the primary value stream, it'll then try and get that secondary value stream. And then it does the same thing for the tertiary, the third value stream. It looks at what hasn't, the battery and the solar hasn't been used for that primary or that secondary, 
and it figures it out for that tertiary value stream. And then of course we have at the end, the gap analysis, which will enable you to find out what if you don't like the results, what you would need for the project to look better um, from one of those value streams or other economic or technical characteristics in the model. I'll hand it off to Christian now to kind of walk us through what we're gonna go through today in this uh, explanation now. Thanks, Simon. Um, so uh, in order to, to make some of these uh, concepts and the structure of the, the two models um, that we use here more clear, we're going to work through an example. So to begin with, um, imagine that you are a consultant or an employee at a um, rural electric co-op, and you are trying to consider um, the value for a solar plus storage project. And for the scenario that, that we're gonna walk through, um, we're imagining that uh, we're gonna use load data that represents uh, an electric cooperative that is uh, winter peaking. Um, so it's, it's greatest loads are, are during the winter months. Um, they already have um, some amount of, of uh, existing solar on their electric system. Uh, and they um, uh, get their electricity from a wholesale supplier, um, which has a local uh, demand charge that they pay. Um, so every month um, they have a demand charge based on their, their, uh, their uh, monthly peak as well as um, a coincident peak charge. Um, so charges where their local uh, system peak is coincident with, uh, um, a, or a charge that's coincident with the, the system-wide peak of the, the wholesale supplier. Um, and then there's also, uh, we're gonna um, explore the potential for uh, time of use wholesale rate um, that may be in the works um, in the in the future. And there's some some um, tools within the specs model that allows one to explore the, the, the benefits of that. And then finally, um, they already have uh, solar on their their system in some places. And maybe they've got a distribution feeder that um, is uh, experiencing high congest uh, congestion and there will need to upgrade that feeder, but that feeder upgrade can be deferred due to um, the implementation of cement uh, energy storage on it. And there will be a, a resulting revenue stream that can come from that. Um, so, uh, what we're going to walk through then is um, utilizing uh, the, the specs model and uh, NREL's uh, system advisor, SAM model, um, in order to reduce, to analyze the revenue streams, the costs and benefits of reducing local and coincident peak demand charges, um, as well as preparing for emergence of time of use markets uh, and um, infrastructure deferral. Um, uh, using uh, through the integration of a solar and battery system. And so the first thing that, let's see, the first thing that um, I can get out of this, the first thing that you're going to want to do um, is to uh, go to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's website. Uh, and, and this is all, how to do this is all outlined in the user manual. Um, and download their system advisor model, SAM. It's uh, absolutely free. Um, you can download it for, for whatever uh, computer system you have, Windows, Mac, uh, Linux, whatever operating system. Um, you download it, install it, and um, and then you can just open up the system advisor model, and uh, I you know I, I should mention that there's 
uh, it's a it's it's quite sophisticated. Sam can do a lot of different things, um, and the the website. NREL's website has a lot of webinars, user, user guides, um, a lot of good information of, of how to run it. For our use, you don't have to worry about uh, needing to, to, to get into the details and, and, and learn all the ins and outs of SAM. With our model, um, you're, you'll be able to download several files, and one of them will be um, a uh, a, a use case that will have all of the default values that we think um, you will need and you can uh, consider consider changing. So in SAM, I'll just go to open an existing project file. Then I'll uh, open the, the specs test case that, that you'll be able to download. And with that test case, you, you already have a lot of the, the default values, um, but then you'll need to go in and, and tailor uh, a few different uh, um, criteria that are, would be applicable to, to your case. So the first thing will be to make sure that you have um, a, a resource file that's relevant to, to where, where you are, where your electric co-op is. And, and this stuff is all um, connected to the internet so you, you can uh, find a, an appropriate weather file for, for your location. Um, and then once you do that, then the next step is, is to put in um, details about your solar and battery system. So you would just then go to system design uh, in our case here, we're going to run a, um, use a, a two megawatt solar PV system. And, uh, and once you enter in that, then you can go down to, uh, the battery system, battery cell and system size. And here for this case, we're going to use, um, a two megawatt battery with, uh, eight megawatts um, of, of energy capacity. So that's a two megawatt battery, uh, four hour duration um, system. And in the user manual, it, it mentions a, a few other things that you wanna uh, leave set within here. So for example, you wanna make sure it's a, a DC connected system if you want the system to be charged by solar. And we won't go into to all the, those details here, but they're outlined in the manual and the default settings will, um, will already, already be set when you open up the, um, up the model. And one other thing to, to make, uh, be careful of is once you set uh, your battery size, go back to system design and look at the sizing summary and just make sure that your inverter capacity will cover um, if the battery size happens to be bigger than the solar. In our case here, we're using a, a two megawatt um, solar with two megawatt battery. And by default, uh, SAM tent will size the inverters um, according to the, the um, solar capacity size. But for example, if we had a um, let's say uh, four megawatt solar uh, battery size, then we would see that, well, the inverter capacity isn't enough to meet that. And so what you need to do is in the DC, desired DC to AC ratio size, you would just need to, to, to reduce that size until your um, inverter capacity is, is large enough to um, cover your, your battery storage. And you will get an error message uh, once you run uh, SAM warning you that the inverter capacity isn't sized to meet your, your battery demand. Um, so in, in this case, uh, we didn't need to, to worry about that because 
um, the inverter capacities for the solar array will also um, be more than enough for the, the maximum battery power. And so the, the final thing that uh, you would, would do before running SAM is go to the electric load. And here is where you would input your uh, 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 load profile for your electric cooperative. And you would just go to edit array. And then here you can import um, a, a file you might have. And it's just, it would just simply be a word profile, a word, uh, a text file with um, the peak load for uh, every hour of, of the year. And, and you can see that here. And there's, um, there's uh, tools here where you can, you can view your, your load profile to make sure it is what, what you expect it, it should be. And so uh, once you have that loaded in, you can just um, run SAM. And uh, there's, so I will hit simulate. And you can, you can just run SAM first here and it will give you a bunch of, of different data and information if you're curious to look at it within SAM. You don't have to um, uh, because we have a, a special script that comes with our model that uh, will be the next step I'll show here that will run SAM and then output the information you need to, um, to run our uh, specs Excel based model. So once you, once you run SAM, it gives you a lot of um, information about the, the system, uh, how it was run. You can look at uh, various graphs, time series, a lot of information to explore here. And again, you, you, you shouldn't feel overwhelmed because uh, you, the, the bulk of the work will be based in the Excel-based model. So I will, the next step then is to go to File, uh, Open Script. And this is, um, the second file that you'll, you'll, you'll download when you download the, um, the specs model. And it's uh, sam to specslk And so I just open that. And it opens this code that you don't have to worry about. But um, uh, the, the code is what prepares the specific outputs that you need for, uh, for the specs model. And so you just go up to run, hit run, um, and Sam will just run again, uh, same process. But this time it will output an Excel model or a, um, a, a CSV file that you will then open, copy, and, and paste into, uh, into the specs model. So we'll just give it a few more seconds to to run. And so it is successfully run. So now um, we go back, there will be uh, an Excel or a, a .csv file that you could open with uh, Excel or any other spreadsheet tool you have. Um, although you will need Excel to run our, our model. So, uh, and in the, the file is going to be called SAM inputs for specs. Open it up. And, and it, uh, here's what the, what the, the data looks like. Um, and the only thing you then have to do, and again, all of these instructions are in the, the manual, uh, you just highlight the, the first six columns. Um, then you copy them. 
Oops. My sorry, my machine is uh, running a little slow here. Um, and then you go to specs, the Excel based model, and you click on the SAM inputs tab. And then you um, paste that data and SAM uh, specs then immediately integrates all of that information. And from here, I will hand uh, the screen share off to Simon, who will then walk you through actually running um, the, the specs Excel based model. Awesome. Thank you, Christian. Um, so, can uh, it looks good to you? Is this are you still showing up? Yep. All right, great. So, um, so like Christian just showed you, he kind of gave you everything up to and how to start using and integrating everything into the model. So, like he showed you, gives you everything up to the SAM inputs tab. And so now I'm going to walk you through those steps. So that was all the data collection um, and part of the data entry. And then we're going to come into this, this inputs tab. And this is the inputs tab is where you're going to do the majority of your work, um, both inputting the rest of your data and getting your results. So earlier, we talked about selecting a value stack, right? And that's what values do you think are going to benefit you the most as a utility or the utility that you're working for with um, in terms of providing savings. Uh, and so when we look at that, um, we have the eight value stacks right here. And I, I mentioned first, second, and then tertiary in terms of the value stack. So you can see here, the top one here is the first value stream. So the first value stream is always gonna be local or coincident peak demand because to this point in time, largely distribution utilities have uh, had a, large or a notable local and coincident peak demand charge. And therefore battery especially is very valuable in reducing that each month and providing significant savings. So um, these are your value stacks and you have, you have eight of them. And so it's gonna be local or coincident peak followed by either again, local or coincident peak or ancillary services or energy arbitrage. So Christian mentioned, we're looking at a scenario where we have a winter peaking rural electric cooperative who has a local and a coincident peak demand charge. And so we're going to say that for this, for this cooperative, that they have an expensive local followed by a secondarily less expensive coincident peak demand. And so therefore, we would want to go after potentially scenario three or value stack three here, because those are the two most uh, expensive parts of their wholesale rate outside of just offsetting the energy charge they have. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to select the value stack I want. So I'm going to go up. It's going to give me a drop down. I'm going to pick three. And that's because we wanted this value stack here, which is the third value stack. Now, one thing in SAM that you uh, that is imported automatically and then you can select is if you want the system charged from solar or from solar and the grid. So in this case, right, we talked about it being DC connected, meaning that the battery is only gonna be charged from solar. And so that automatically is imported into that SAM inputs tab from the decision that you made earlier in SAM. That's a part of the, the user manual as well. So now that we've selected and we've decided we're gonna look at value stack three, because we know we have these first two value streams currently that we could get, we're gonna come down here. So you'll see that everything in yellow inputs, they're ones that are matched from SAM, which means that you don't change these. You don't have to do anything. They automatically get pulled in from that SAM inputs tab. Anything in green is something that the user needs to select. So we selected that value stack three, and now we're gonna come down here. And so you'll see that the PV size, right? It was a, it was a two megawatt array. We have the DC to AC ratio. Um, and then the, the de degradation rate, that's already calculated as well. Now these red boxes are calculated as a function of the inputs. So from SAM, it looks like our two megawatt array gives us about 3.56 gigawatt hours of solar uh, in year one. 
So that's going to be annually. It's going to degrade over time. But that's your first year. And then that total AC capacity is going to be 2.34. And that's, that's going to be your, you know, basically your inverter potential output. Um, so then down here, battery system. So yes, we want a battery system. <laughs> and then the, the, you, the inputs that we have brought in from SAM are going to then be allowed to be used in the calculations. So you're going to have all of your, all of your battery inputs down here. So we have a, you know, a two, two megawatt AC, four hours, which will give you four megawatt hours, or sorry, eight megawatt hours of energy. Um, Sam, some of the predisposed or predetermined uh, things in that in that example file we gave you are the minimum and the maximum state of charge, right? So a battery that you buy will only have will only be allowed to charge and discharge so much to protect the battery, and so the minimum state of charge is is fifteen percent here, and the maximum will be ninety five percent, which means that the red cell here is what we call the effective battery capacity. So if you're entering into a contract, a PPA, or a battery energy service agreement, you're going to get the agreement for likely will be for the effect of battery capacity, which means how much they can actually use. And so therefore, in this case, because of that maximum and minimum state of charge, the actual effect of battery that is usable and the energy that's usable um, by the utility is going to be 6.4 megawatt hours of energy in that battery. Now, it's going to be able to output at that two megawatts still, but it won't output for the full four hours that the battery technically has because it's limited by that maximum instead of charge. So all of this is already imported. So then we have to come down here and, and the model comes preloaded with some things like basic assumptions around PPA price or battery ESA price. However, these are all things that are gonna be unique to each co-op and what they think they can get when they come up for rates. So the model assumes that you're using a, a PPA, right? Not being owned by the co-op, but they're, they're going through a third party who's going to sell them that rate so that they don't have to put the capital up. And so we've already gone ahead and put in some rates here. So we're saying it's about four cents per kilowatt hour for the solar system alone. And there's going to be an additional four and a half cents per kilowatt hour associated with that battery. And so together, you're going to get a total PPA and ESA price that comes to eight and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So you would be paying that to the developer that would be providing you the services. Now, this contract price escalator is uh, the amount that the contract will could increase per year. Default, we're saying it's zero. So you'd have a fixed rate of eight and a half cents over the life of that PPA. Now, you could have a PPA where it does escalate with time. And so this is assuming that it does not escalate with time. Um, and then we have some other assumptions around the battery down here. So calendar degradation rate is uh, what a battery, a battery degrades over time naturally just because of the chemicals and the life when it sits on the shelf. And so we're assuming 1%. Uh, end of life, that's gonna be, at what point is the battery considered defunct, right? Batteries, we don't actually use them till there's none of it left. We use them until classically there's 80% of the battery left. And then we consider the battery to need to be replaced so that we have as much of the battery as we can use. Um, and then this turnovers to reach 90% uh, of the capacity. This is how we account for that degradation that is used not from the calendar, but from the actual throughput of the battery. Now we've gone ahead and, and there's a whole thing in the user manual about this section, battery degradation. I suggest you read it to get a good, good grip on it. However, what I would mention here is that we have a default in here based upon the current market and the current technologies out there. And so 1300 is gonna be your average uh, for how quickly the battery degrades as you use it. Um, now, one thing to note is that some PPAs, you could enter a degradation rate here of zero and zero. And the reason that could be the case is because you could enter into a contract wherein the PPA says you're guaranteed a certain amount of battery capacity, so this effective capacity, and then the developer actually accounts for that in their calculations, and they're selling you an agreement wherein the battery does not degrade from your perspective. Of course, the battery is degrading, but the developer is accounting for that, and there are specific limitations in the contract. And so there's some uh, there's some uh, uh, supporting materials that are a part of the specs project that will help you understand that. Um, so now to get to the rest of it. So 
some important things to understanding the savings that can be generated from solar, right? So this is all kind of the costs, but we have some savings. So those savings are based upon the wholesale rate that, that the utility pays from their GNT to get their energy. So we mentioned, so of course there's the wholesale energy cost. How much does a utility pay for energy? So here we're gonna go ahead and enter uh, you know, three and a half cents per kilowatt hour. We're assuming that the utility buys energy from their GNT at three and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Currently, we assume that's a flat rate, and that's what all energy costs. However, we have another input here, which is wholesale energy cost to off peak. And this would be if there was a time of use rate, right? We mentioned that we're gonna look at a scenario where we expect that time of use might come to fruition in the future, right? Um, and so, we're gonna say that the off peak rate of energy would be less than that standard on peak um, or just the standard flat rate of three and a half cents. So we're gonna say it's 2.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, we have some other inputs here, electricity cost escalation rate, of course, how much do we expect the cost of energy to go up over time? And then we have the two other charges, the local demand charge and the coincident peak demand charge. So, We've gone ahead and put in two, dollar, uh, two numbers here. So we have three and a half dollars per kilowatt. So that's saying your local demand, you get charged once a month for the peak local demand. So whenever your utility has its peak each month, you're gonna get charged three and a half dollars per kilowatt in that hour. Um, and then we have the utility demand escalation rate. We assume that much like energy might also increase over time. So we have 1% in here as a default. And then utility coincident peak demand charge would be the actual, it would be the, like Christian mentioned Erland, earlier, it will be, of course, the peak charge uh, that the GNT sees, what hour that is, and you get charged at the end of the month based upon what your, uh, what your consumption is as a utility during that hour. And so here it's right, because it's cheaper, it's $3 per kilowatt during that hour. That's why we selected coincident peak as the second value in our value stack, right? We didn't choose coincident peak first because it costs a little less um, to the utility when they're purchasing power. So we also have frequency regulation here, but you can see that the it says no, which means that we're not going to consider frequency regulation because the value stack we're using doesn't account for it. And I will come back and discuss that a little bit more later and how we will look at that. Now, coincident peak inputs, of course, we have to know when the coincident peak was. So the local peak is calculated by SAM because you can look at that. But the coincident peak isn't a function of your load, it's a function of the GNT's load. So what's going to happen is you're going to have to come down here if you're looking at a value stack that has a coincident peak. And you're going to have to get historical bills, right, that match up with your previous, with that load profile that you put into SAM in that last step before running. And you're going to enter the month, the day, and of course the year as well as the hour which they, it occurred in, right? And so that way we can calculate what was your battery and your solar's output during that hour. And so the you just enter the date using normal date protocol or at least US date protocol where in its um, month, day, year. And then you're just gonna pick from each one, each month you're gonna pick from the dropdown menu using uh, hour starting uh, nomenclature here, zero through 23 hours for each one. So I've gone ahead and already entered this so you have these morning peaks, of course, in the winter time because it's a, a winter peaking and we have high loads in the morning because of heating. And then you have those afternoon peaks in the summertime when air conditioning is running. And so that's kind of a classic load profile. So it's probably gonna follow pretty closely with your local demand peaks, but it may not match up exactly. And so it's important that you put this in here. And then because we've selected value stack three with energy arbitrage, it says yes next to energy arbitrage, meaning time of use. Basically, can we shift energy from off peak when it's produced when it would be worth less being sold to a time when on peak energy when it's worth more, aka that, that three and a half cents versus that 2.8 cents. Um, and so that is that is default yes because we've selected that, which means that you're going to get uh, a value from this. And then what we do is because time of use rates are somewhat unknown and may not be currently being utilized or might not be a part of the wholesale structure is we provide some defaults. So we provide four different options for when your time of use rates or how they work. So early afternoon peak all year, late afternoon peak all year or seasonal summer, early afternoon peak and winter morning slash evening peaks. So these are three different defaults 
which are dictated in the user manual. And I'll show you where you can edit these because you can select also a manual input wherein what you're selecting here is which hours are on peak and which hours are off peak. And by doing that, the model knows which energy can be shifted from which hours. And therefore you can see what your potential savings for solar would be if you were using the battery. And then the other option you have is picking between every day or weekdays, and of course none. So if I select no days, even though we've selected this value stack, I will no longer get the benefit because this is saying that there's no days where time of use is operational. So this is one way to void that value of energy arbitrage and figure out in the current time where we don't have energy arbitrage potential because we don't have a time of use rate, therefore we can analyze it. And so I'm gonna leave it off for now and I'll come back and turn it on in a minute. And then there's some other financial parameters, right? Inflation rate, the discount rate, uh, cost of capital. These are the kind of things we need to know to calculate things like net present value and to compare things. And there's also the REC price, right? A renewable energy credit. What is that solar worth uh, in the market versus for offsetting carbon-based energy? And so we account for that here too. And then there's some, uh, some additional value streams here. And I'm gonna come back and explain them a little more in a bit, but we have infrastructure deferral, a microgrid system and resilience capability. I'm gonna come back and focus more on the infrastructure deferral um, and explain what that means and, and how we can use it. But these are also laid out in the user manual in more detail. And basically you enter, if you want to use them, you're gonna enter yes. And then you can enter the value as defined by the user manual, what, what's the thing here. So once I've done that, I have basically entered all the information I have to put in for the model to actually run. And so the model is already complete at this point and I can literally scroll down to my results section right here. And so if I, if I scroll down right here to my results sections, what I'm gonna get is a number of very simple overview tables. Um, I'm gonna get some basic metrics right here on the left side, return on investment, net present value, and then the benefit cost ratio, as well as the actual benefits and costs laid out in value. And so what you're seeing here right now is that the ROI we're seeing is actually a negative 16%. And we have, a, we have a net present value that's actually negative half a million or pro, a pro, sorry, half a billion, 500, no 500,000, half a million. <laughs> um, and so clearly the project at, way we're looking at it right now doesn't look great. Um, you know, we see that we have the value stacks over the life of the project. So you see everything below is that orange is gonna be the cost of the PPA. And then it actually shows you the literal value stack on one another um, above it in each year. And so you'll see that, you know, the, the biggest value benefit here looks like it's avoided wholesale energy. Now, the makeup of these benefits are actually laid out here in a pie chart. So you can see what is making up the biggest thing. So it looks like avoided wholesale energy costs are the biggest benefit we have, meaning that just offsetting that energy that you would have to otherwise buy from your wholesale provider is going to be the biggest benefit in this current value stack under this current regime of, uh, of rates. Now, the second biggest one at 23% is gonna be your avoided local demand. So because that local demand, right, is being charged at three and a half dollars, the battery and solar is actually doing a pretty good job of reducing that and it's saving you the, uh, the next 23% of your bill. And then the last thing there is coincident peak savings. So because it's secondary to local, actually you're gonna utilize the battery and solar less often to do this and it only costs three dollars per kilowatt so it's worth less and you can see the same thing laid out here in actual dollar values laid out over uh over a year as well as we have the, the nominal and the the cumulative cash flow what you're seeing is over the life of the project you're seeing the cumulative and the nominal cash flow um and and, and so these are some some great basic results that you're seeing now, what I want to lay out is when you're looking Hi, at man. this. What I, this yeah. is Jill. Hi. Um, and for our viewers, you know, we're, we're uh, going through this and, and kind of watching it with an eye for what, our, for what our users might want. And I think this has been a fan, fantastic uh, review of a lot of data at this point. So I, I just thought it wouldn't hurt us to pause for just a second. Um, partly so our viewers can digest you know what you've done so far but i think the the number one question that that some of our viewers may have in their minds is well 
you're asking for a lot of information about battery storage um, and about the system. If this is an early stage decision model, um, the user may not know the exact answers to some of these things. And um, as you've demonstrated, we do have defaults in the model for many of these things. Um, could you comment just a little bit on what could a user learn from this? How would you summarize the learning opportunity, even if it's the first time they run it before they have a lot of refinement in exactly they want what they want? So just if you just give us a little feedback on what would the user get out of this if they are running it? for the first time or early in the game and they don't have exact answers for all of these possibilities? Sure. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing you're gonna learn is just getting a feel for what those value streams are and how, which ones are the most valuable, right? So of course we're talking about a value stack here. And so I think it's really great to understand even if the value isn't perfect, isn't spot on, maybe you don't know exactly which value stack you want you're gonna to start to get a feel for which are the most valuable value streams under the current rate structure, um, which I think is super valuable just to understand, does this, does this make sense, right? It's an early stage decision model. Should we go forward or should we not? Now, this is of course one scenario with one set of numbers and they may not be exact numbers because we're still trying to figure out what makes sense. Mm -hmm. and so. I think this is a great opportunity to start talking about how you can analyze alternative scenarios, how you can kind of make this an iterative process. And as you saw, we don't, we don't really like the, the results here, right? This is negative. We want a positive result, right? You want a net present value that's positive. You want a return on investment that's positive. So I think if I could, I would love to walk through some of the additional benefits here and different additional ways you can use the model to, to look at these things now. So right, right. And, and I think that's what we need to do here. I wanted to recall to people again, you mentioned several places where the user's guide has additional information. It really does educate people a lot about the battery degradation issue. Um, also, there's a little bit of information there about the power purchase agreement versus payment for asset. Um, there, what we have learned in our research is that at this time in market development, there is no simple rule of thumb for translating a PPA and energy service agreement into an asset purchase price. So we chose to do it this way because we see a lot of activity in the market going towards the PPA and the energy services agreement co-ops and municipal utilities being non-taxable oftentimes have to work with a development partner in order to access the investment tax credit or you know, those benefits. And there are also some operational benefits um, in working with the PPA ESA model. Um, if you were to change that to uh, an asset purchase, it wouldn't run through the model that way, but you could do a calculation in your mind so that you would know, you know, look up what the current, you know, cost is in your area for uh, a battery if you were to purchase it. And just, you know, realize that there is a correlation. It's just not a calculation that we could put in here because at this point in time, um, pricing is partly based on what market you're in. If you're in a market that's very hot, um, very competitive, you'll see a different um, calculus than if you're in a market where people have never done this kind of thing before. So um, is that a pretty good summary, do you think, Simon, or do you have anything to add to that? Not that, but I would love to dive into the sensitivity analysis and the gap analysis real quick. Um, Perfect. And infrastructure deferral, so. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Sounds great, so yeah, so. What I just walked through is a, a basic preliminary analysis, right? Um, but there's a lot of potential opportunities for future analysis, right? So we've talked about what if time of use became a thing. So energy arbitrage is our third. So what if I came up here and I said that energy arbitrage was being used on weekdays? So immediately what we're gonna see is a change because now if we come down here, 
we can see that there's a revenue from energy arbitrage, which is that 3% right there. Now, if you notice over here in the results, the ROI, it actually went down. And that's because under this situation with the batteries degradation and the value between the two, the off peak and the on piece, it's actually gonna be, it's gonna cost more, it looks like, to operate the battery. It's gonna be more uh, negative because of the degradation than it would be positive because of that. And so that's something to keep an eye out for. As, as you do this analysis, maybe it's not going to be the right thing you want. And so that's a good thing you can learn from it. So you can toggle features on and off to some degree like that. Now, another thing that's really valuable is this gap analysis right here. So currently we have, we're in a hole, right? We have, we have a negative ROI and a negative net present value. So the question is, how do I get that to be positive or even just zero, maybe even just a break even? And so down here, what we have is what's called the gap analysis tool. It has some basic directions on how to use it, but also they're in the manual as well. And so the question is, what would need to change for this project to make sense? So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna say, what's my input variable? I'm gonna select local demand charge, which currently is 350 right, three, $3.50 per kilowatt. And I have an ROI that is negative 23%. Well, I wanna know how high would that demand charge have to be under this scenario for this project to become, let's say, we want that project to be zero. We want the, re the return on investment to be 0%. So we want it to be no losses, basically, right? You want, the, you want that to be a, a positive, nothing better, nothing worse than zero. <laughs> and so what I'm gonna say is how much does this need to change under the current situation? And so what I'll do is I'll press run gap analysis. It'll ask me, what is the desired ROI? And so I'll just say zero. I just wanna get to zero. What has that changed? And if I press okay, what it's gonna do is it's gonna automatically run and change that input right here. It's gonna change that local demand charge and tell me that in order for to change nothing else, if I wanted the product to have an ROI of zero, I'd have to have a $7.70 local demand charge, right? So up here, it actually changes that input and we're at 770. Now, we now see we have, a, we have a zero ROI and we have a net present value of, of zero, right? And that's what we'd expect. And so you can see these things have all changed, including the fact that the avoided wholesale energy cost is actually now a smaller portion because we're offsetting, we're creating more savings, 43% of the savings from the battery and solar offsetting that local demand charge. Um, now, the question is this, we don't think that's realistic maybe, right? We don't think we're gonna suddenly see at the current rate, 770 be that full, that's not, it's not gonna go up that much, right? And so maybe we, we, uh, we leave this here because we wanna see what it would look like. But another thing we can do is we can use the sensitivity analysis to figure out how minor changes would impact these things. Um, and so that's, so this is one way to, to analyze the differences on how you get somewhere. But another thing you can do is the sensitivity analysis. So if you go to the sensitivity analysis tab here, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to have a, a bunch of inputs very similar to the gap analysis. But what we're going to be able to do is change across a, a number, not just change one value, but we'll be able to change two values and multiple of those values to see what they look like. So let's say I want to know how changing my local demand charge and how changing my coincident peak demand charge, right, would change the net present value. So currently we, at the current rate, we have them at 770 and $3 per kilowatt. And so that gives us a net present value of zero, right? But I wanna know if I change each of those things by 3% along this table either way, and I do that a total of five times, starting with the current value, what will happen to my net present value? So if I go ahead and change those, I can select a different, I can, I can change this and I can say this is 5% if I'd like, and I can have both things change 5%, and I'm gonna have it change five times. If I change this to seven, you would see that it would actually fill in more of these things on this table. And it gives you the idea is you can make a smaller or a larger table. Now this does require computational power. So the bigger number you select, the longer it's gonna to take to run. So I'm gonna stick with five. And then you just click begin sensitivity analysis. What this, what this model is gonna do is it's gonna start running multiple scenarios. So it's going to start inputting at different rates, what would be the net present value? And so 
as this brings up the answers, you're going to see it's filling in this table, which is color coding. So you understand if it's worse or better than what it was before. And it's also going to start filling out these graphs to show you how, if you hold one of those values constant, how it affects the other value. And so what, what you see in the middle here is that under the current, which is 770 and $3 per kilowatt, we're getting what we were expecting at zero, right? That's the default scenario we're looking at. And then if we look at the other ones, if the rates are higher, right? So if, if my coincident peak rate costs more than $3 or the local demand costs more than 770, I'm getting a positive net present value, which makes sense because your battery and solar are offsetting more of the cost that costs more. And so the value of those things is greater. However, if these go down, they of course create a, a, a less uh, favorable project. And so you can hold one value constant or you can move both. The idea here being it gives you a feel for both visually and graphic and, and, and you know, not graphically, I guess this would be figures graphically. And then just visually with, it, with a real basic idea of, oh, I see that's, that's lower, we don't like that. Um, and so we, we don't like the less red, we like the higher, the lighter colors here. And so you, if you've got it, even if over a year, say the charge went up 5%, you would now save an extra $71,000 over the life of the project. And so this gives you an idea for as how rates change over time, how does that impact your project, right? Is it gonna be a marginal impact or is it gonna be a significant impact as the rates change? Now, one last thing I wanna do, come back here to the inputs is, to look at some of these additional features that we have. So, right, you know, we talked about how you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Similarly, I think batteries and solar can provide a lot of value um, that are additional that we don't really fully calculate or they don't get calculated well oftentimes because we don't know how we're going to use these things. But batteries can oftentimes provide a benefit that um, that is hard to characterize. And so one of those might be infrastructure deferral, right? So what if you had a feeder that was similar to say this feeder that we're, we're considering in this analysis and that feeder is overwhelmed, right? You have to defer, you need to, you need to upgrade that line for some reason, whether it's increased load on the line or there's increased solar. And so you're having that feeder, that conductor is being overwhelmed. Well, maybe you wanna, maybe this battery, because it's located on that feeder, it's designed and implemented on that feeder with that solar and storage, and it interconnects there, perhaps it could delay the need to upgrade that line because the battery is actually providing local generation. So it's, it's easing that load that is very large there, right? And so what that means is that if I went here and I said, okay, I want to account for infrastructure deferral and say it would cost a million dollars to update that feeder and you're deferring it five years by installing the solar and battery system. Well, if I turn that on, it's gonna calculate the value, the net present value of that project that you deferred because you no longer have to spend that a million dollars now, you can spend it five years from now. And so you're gonna save a net present value of 154,000. And so if I come down here, now we see that my ROI, my, my, my budget just got better, right? I've now saved $154,000 at 5% ROI. And you can see this new, this bar, right? You can see this positive bar year zero which is that net present value being calculated of that a million dollars that you saved over five years that you deferred. And so now you'll see, right, we have a project which has a net present value with a good cumulative cash flow and a, and a utility annual cash flow that is positive in the first year because of that 157,000 or 154,000 you saved. But over, over time each year, as the rates increase, you're starting to get a, a yearly positive cash flow, which is great. Um, a lot of these things are explained in much greater detail in the manual. Um, there's a lot of tabs here, which is where the calculations are done. So if you want to go into the nitty gritty of it, you can. The most valuable thing here is going to this values tab at the end. And these were a lot of the assumptions that are made in the model or the calculations are made are laid out. The most valuable thing here though, is this manual input for energy arbitrage. So if you, if you remember back here, we were given time of use, and, and you were given the option to select which kind of time of use rate or hours are gonna be on. If you select the manual input here, what that means is if you go to this values tab, you're gonna be given, there's these three tables that are preloaded, but what you can actually do is you can come in here and modify this table 
where one is off peak and zero is on peak. And you can select in every month for every hour, zero through 23, which hours are off peak and on peak. And that enables you to look at both how a future rate might look or one that isn't preloaded or predetermined rate. But also it helps define if you wanted to compare different time of use rates and understand how um, shifting those on peak and off peak hours under a theoretical time of use rate that might be proposed by your wholesale provider will impact the economics of the project or make it better or worse for you. And so that gives you more flexibility under those time of use rates as well. So for right now, I think I'm gonna stick with that and I'm gonna hand things back off to Jill um, just because of, for time's sake, there's a lot more you can do with this model. Um, you can play with it. You can make it a kind of a continual loop, like I said, right? This is a, a iterative process because it is, um, because it's not optimization. It gives you that opportunity to compare different value stacks. You could select different value stacks and see how they work. But I think I'm gonna leave it there for right now, um, just as an example, and let Jill take over. And if you have any more thoughts, as you can read through the manual and it'll explain more about those details and how to operate these things and the logic behind them. Great, great, thank you. So um, Simon, could you just give us a real brief definition of how the, uh, the microgrid system and the resilience capacity uh, actually capabilities actually work? Sure, they're pretty, they're pretty simple. They're really, they don't actually impact uh, the technical operations. What they're really doing is they're defining if, uh, how these things would play into uh, the total cost. Uh, so the economic, not the technical cost, but the economic cost, as well as, is it meeting your needs? So if you wanted to do a microgrid system, right? If you put this as a yes, it would then of course tell you if you entered the cost per megawatt, how much that, that total capital cost would be. And then it would play that, it would, it would uh, deploy that into the costs here in the model. And you, you can see here that the, the ROI and the net present value have not gone down because it costs more. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the resilience capability actually isn't cost, but it tells you if it's capable of providing the resilience. So say you wanted to do a microgrid that you wanted to be resilient in case of an outage. If you make this yes, it accounts for that. But what it fundamentally does is it's checking if you define what uh, duration outage you have and what your lost load could be, it's gonna tell you if you're going to meet that. Can your battery meet that? And so it's saying the percent of peak lost load battery can meet is 140%. Meaning that if your battery was fully charged and there was an outage, it would be resilient. It could meet all of that, that peak load and that, that average load, it's gonna, it's gonna be able to provide that resiliency. If of course it did not provide that, it would be below 100%, and therefore your battery under best scenario still would not meet all the load you'd need. And so this is just a way to test it, right? Resiliency and microgrids are a whole other can of worms, but we just wanted to provide that so a user could see what the system could do if you wanted to look at a microgrid or a resiliency based. Yeah, yeah and I, I wanted to add another comment, um, which people can read more about, which is the, the gap analysis uh, philosophy. The, we know that these values that are presented in the model are not the only and complete values for distribution deferral or for resilience. But what we've discovered is that when these projects are presented to a co-op board, um, the decision makers have a lot more on their minds than the things that are typically calculated in a utility calculation. So to put some economic value in, such as a placeholder, and to use this theory that as Simon showed you, you develop what your target is. If you want a break even project, then you know you have a gap between where your project is and where it breaks even, how much extra value do you need? And in some sense, it is a negotiation, but it's a reasonable proxy and it tends to be very conservative. We find that, um, you know, instead of going into some kind of formal process, which, which talks about value of solar and can become very contentious, this is a more conversational approach, um, which just allows utility decision makers to take into account some of those strategic values that they know are not worth zero. They just don't know 
with the tools that they have with them right now in the early stage of project development, they may not know exactly um, how to price that. And, um, Christian, you may want to come back on screen for just a minute um, as I, I really want to credit you also. Um, Simon and Christian worked together on this, um, on every aspect of it. And uh, we also had, uh, of course, that liaison with the, the NREL SAM model. Um, the SAM model has done a lot of things. It is not often used for utility side uh, front of the meter projects. Um, and the SAM model is usually at this point used for uh, a demand charge, um, uh, avoidance of demand charges. But if, but if that's the only value that you're looking at, um, you may miss part of the point. Uh, so, you know, the specs model, I think some of the things that it achieves are um, being able to work, you know, relatively simply on an Excel spreadsheet, um, being able to do these very cool things with, um, you know, the gap analysis and the sensitivity analysis. Um, and also, I, I didn't really spend any time on that slide at the very beginning, but one of the output tabs on the model is um, a concise and complete synopsis that you can use in developing your RFP. So when you actually get down to the negotiation, the final negotiation, we recommend that you use some legal support and some you know, more in-depth technical support. But you will find that if you go into a discussion with developers with some knowledge of what your project is and what you want out of it and whether it can feasibly remotely be possible for you, you can get through that discussion a lot faster. Um, and get to a point of really closing on the important issues. Um, Christian, um, before we sign off, I wondered whether you had any final words or observations. You'll have to unmute. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think you, you both did a wonderful job um, walking through the model and, and some of the different components of it. Um, so yeah, don't, don't have anything, uh, at this point to add. Okay. And there's going to be more information, um, posted on the website with this, along with the PowerPoint slides that you can download. Um, so that if you have questions or you want some, you know, one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, there will be some avenues open. Um, and at this point, I guess I just want to thank you all, um, and stay in touch with the Specs project. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Christian. Bye.